I'm Arthur Demrich, director of the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation, and it's my great honor and great joy to be able to welcome you to today's program. Uh, we're housed here in the Innovation Wing, so this opened in 2015 as a way to really engage the public, engage our museum visitors in understanding how inventors think, more importantly, how inventors work, the hands-on skills, what it takes, um, and also just begin to understand the role of invention and innovation for the U.S. economy more broadly. And today, we have a very special occasion because we're celebrating 10 million U.S. patents. And we're going to explore the importance of invention and innovation over the past 200 years, but also think and discuss with our amazing panel the view to the future. So the framers of our Constitution in 1789 wrote, Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So patents encourage inventors to disclose what they've done. It's no longer a world of secrecy, of hiding it. It's no longer a world of alchemy, of coding what you've done in some secret way. You now disclose it. And in exchange, you get a monopoly right for limited time from which you can earn revenue, from which you can profit. That has encouraged an amazing invention and innovation machine in the United States. And so we're here today some 228 years after the very first US patent was issued to Samuel Hopkins in 1790 for a new way of making potash and pearl ash, which were used in glass making and gunpowder. And we're 182 years after Senator John Ruggles from Maine received the new patent number one in 1836 for a way of improving the traction of train locomotives. So the early industrial revolution is about, of course, steam power and rail. And here already, the patents and the invention are key to that revolution unfolding. And the patents that have been issued since are really an amazing record of the history of invention and illustrate these revolutionary moments in how our economy has transformed. So patent number 1000 in 1838 is a way of making railroad cars more comfortable for passengers. So we've gone from a steam engine gaining traction on the track to actually passenger transport. The 10,000th patent in 1853 is for paddle wheels for a ship. So think about inland transportation, the growing domestic economy of the United States, internal trade, and of course, westward expansion. Patent 100,000 in 1870 was for a sunbonnet for a horse. <laughs> so patents really run the gamut. They're not just industrial, right? So prevent your horse from fainting. So then I, of course, had to look up patent 100,001, and it's a mechanical seed planter and fertilizer spreader. So the industrialization of agriculture is beginning by the 1870s. Patent 1 million was issued in 1911 for an improvement to vehicle tires, and yesterday, the USPTO issued the 10 millionth patent to the inventor Joe Marin, an employee of Raytheon, for laser detection and ranging system. So it offers a way of maintaining clear optics, as in a camera, while also accurately measuring speed and distance. So the obvious, perhaps obvious, application is for driverless cars. But I heard the inventor interviewed on NPR yesterday, and he also mentioned the use in video games. So you really see inventions have multiple uses. And we're very fortunate that that inventor is here today. So please stand up and everyone join me in applauding them. And so we're thrilled to have you, thank you. And uh, with that, I really wanna start the panel. So I'm gonna go over here. And, um, with me on stage to my immediate right is Jim West, the inventor of the electric microphone, longtime employee and inventor at Bell Labs and now at Johns Hopkins. Next to him is Adam Mossoff, a historian and legal scholar at the uh, George Mason University and the uh, Center for Protection of Intellectual Property. Then we have Drew Hirschfeld, the commissioner for patents at the USPTO. And finally, Zuzi Armstrong, who's an inventor and uh, now a uh, sort of policy person at Qualcomm, um, most famous for inventing some of the, switching the information technology to connect cell phones to the internet. Um, and they're each gonna talk a little more about what they've done and their backgrounds as we go. Um, but I wanted to start with each of them and ask them, who's your favorite inventor from history and why? 
<laughs> okay. We're all gonna pass down. Yeah. All right, we'll start with Susie. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's not ancient history, but I think my, frame, my favorite inventor is Dr. Erwin Jacobs, who was uh, seminal in uh, inventing CDMA, which of course is the uh, digital technology that connected, uh, originally connected your cell phone to the internet. And part of the reason I, he's my favorite inventor is I had the honor of actually working with him uh, in the early days at Qualcomm. I'd been there in 24 years. Uh, <laughs> how did that happen? And uh, the other thing I, I, I so admire about uh, Dr. Jacobs is that um, he embodies what I think of as the perse perseverance that it takes to invent something. People told him that CDMA wouldn't work. You know, there were a lot, he didn't do it alone. There were a lot of, there were a lot of misstarts and a lot of uh, uh, failures along the way, but I think um, part of the theme of this, this panel here is that most of these inventions probably aren't, you know, these aha moments and, you know, Benjamin Franklin with a kite on a string. <laughs> They're the result of um, a whole lot of hard work and perseverance and, and making sure that you don't let people tell you it cannot be done. Yeah. Um when I started looking for, for places to work, Bell Labs was very appealing to me because there were people who looked like me that I wanted to be like when I grew up. And so one of the uh, employees, uh, Dr. Lincoln Hawkins, who was my mentor at Bell Labs, is credited with some of the most money-saving patents ever. And what he did was to learn to cure polyethylene so it wouldn't degrade under UV radiation, under radiation from the sun. And, and the reason that that's so important is because lead was a major sheath for cables at that time. And we all know how dangerous lead is. And, and the fact that if all of our cables had lead on them, many of us wouldn't be here because of the contamination that's due from the lead. Uh, he became my mentor uh, and, uh, and really taught me the ropes, and I feel that I was pretty successful, mainly because of what he taught me as my mentor. Very cool. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, and I know Adam is stressing about this as a historian. <laughs> yes. This is a really hard question for him. I'll try to talk the rest what? of the panel for you so <laughs> that you don't have to actually answer. Thank I you. am also stressing with this question. This is really hard. Um, uh, so I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to break the, the rules a little bit. I want to talk about a, a quick story about inspiration from inventors. Um, I've been at the USPTO for 24 years, almost 24. And in 2010, I had the opportunity to go to a National Inventors Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And part of what they do at these ceremonies is you see the videos, you see these wonderful, you know, three, four, five minute videos of the inventors who were getting inducted. And I was so moved at the time, and I was chief of staff for the agency, um, but I was so moved at the time uh, by these videos uh, that I thought if I ever get in a position to be able to share these for the many, many employees uh, at the USPTO, I'm going to do so. So three years ago, I became commissioner, and in my first meeting with my managers, and. Um, uh, I, I, I used these videos, and, and it was about uh, you know, 700 people in the room, and I, and I brought in a video of, of one of the inventors, and I said, let me know what you think about this, because this moves me and this inspires me, and, and I got such an overwhelming positive response, because learning the great stories of the many inventors um, that we have uh, is just phenomenal, and so I had such a great response, I continued to do the videos, and I ended up uh, actually then transitioning to bringing in um, inventors to talk. So I will give names because I don't want to break the rules too much, but two inventors that I brought in, one was Steve Sasson, who is the inventor of the digital camera. And um, he inspires me, uh, so he would definitely be at the top of my list. He inspires me not only for being such an out-of-the-box thinker, he worked at a film company, K Kodak, when he invented the digital camera. Now think about that, right? Digital camera obviously um, did away with film. So talk about out of the box, you, you can't get more out of the box than that. 
But in addition, what, what moves me about him is, is how much he gives back to the community. And he's part of the, the National Letters Hall of Fame camp invention. He works with children. And I just find that very inspiring to, to be able to witness him uh, very frequently giving back to the community. Uh, the other inventor that, that I brought in to talk to all my managers was Lisa Seacat DeLuca, who is a master inventor at IBM. And um, talk about being inspirational. Um, she, she, first of all, she has two sets of twins, which is really not relevant to patents, but just amazing <laughs> fact in and of itself. Uh, but she has over, um, I don't know the exact number, and they're young kids too, right? So, but anyway, she has over 200 uh, patents. I think it's over 250 patents. She's IBM's most prolific female inventor. Probably that makes her you know, the, the nation's most prolific female inventor. Just an incredible person, always thinking about what that next step forward is, and just uh, an incredible story in and of herself. So those would be two people that jump out at me. So Adam, um, just <laughs> I'll, I'll make it easier to tell us your favorite inventor from the 19th century. Oh, it's, it's such an unfair question, is I, <laughs> <laughs> because you study one inventor and you say such an amazing person, and then you, and this is my favorite one, whether it's Charles Goodyear or Samuel Morse or something. Um, I have, by the way, one set of twins, and I can tell you that's highly <laughs> relevant to the fact that she's so productive and so inventive. Yes. Um, but the, uh, but you know, one of my favorite inventors actually from history and actually is from the 20th century. Uh, so I will, I will challenge your question, uh, and that's Hedy Lamarr, um, which a lot of people don't know as an inventor. Most people know of Hedy Lamarr as the glamorous movie star <laughs> from 1930s and 40s, um, and yet she was, uh, she invented uh, signal hopping uh, technology um, that was. Uh, fundamental for the guidance in World War II of our torpedoes and of, uh, and, and of other weapons that was a key at that time. But actually, far more important than that, it's the foundational technology upon which then Erwin Jacobs developed CDMA later. And so it is, she is at, at root the, you know, one of the very important inventors of what makes all of our digital communication systems work today, our laptops, our, our smartphones, all of our smart devices. Um, the, her technology, is, as I said, was built upon by Erwin Jacobs and, um, and is used in all of our, our, our devices that communicate with each other. And, it, and one of the reasons why I really, really like her as an inventor is um, it, it's, uh, she represents, I think, kind of the uh, awesome uh, aspect of what makes the American innovation system work, which is that it's kind of an out of the box, unexpected source of innovation, um, which is what a lot of inventors are. Um, they're not the people that you know you would normally think of as the place where the innovation is going to come from. And, um, and yet it did. And it was important, of course, for us winning World War II, but even more important for the civilian technologies that we developed 30 or 40 years later and made our lives today a veritable miracle. Great. I thought about I mean, naming Hedy yes. Lamarr, but I, I'm not old enough to have worked with her. <laughs> <laughs> not even close. Not even close. Um, Jim, I, I wanted to turn to you next and ask you, kind of walk us through the experience of being an inventor, the idea of building the prototype, testing it, what failed, what succeeded. Yeah, um, sometimes nothing, but those are the games we, we play. Um, uh, it, uh, life for me is always running around the rim of the glass. Sometimes I fall in, sometimes I fall out. Um, and let's not worry about which is the right way to fall, just get off the edge. Um, the moral of, 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 of that short story is that curiosity is the mother of all invention. And Curiosity started with me very early. I took my grandfather's pocket watch apart and got into big trouble over it. 105 parts in it, but I couldn't get it back together <laughs> and that caused a big deal of trouble. So, um, and, and this is a, a, a message to all you families out there with young kids. Let them experiment, let, let them mess around, let them play because they're gonna get in trouble like I did, but Look, it paid off. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the, the process of inventing, of finding something new, is usually a challenge to nature because nature is the, is the big inventor in, in, in the whole universe. And uh, it is not always pleasant because 
things don't work the way you think they work, they work the way nature wants them to work, okay? And so you have to overcome the hurdles to understand the language of nature, to understand what nature is telling you when, when things don't work. Usually right now, and, and uh, most of you, if, if you, there's a fixed solution to a problem, well, if you're inventing something, it doesn't exist. So there are no guidelines to say whether it's a good invention or whether it isn't. When my colleague and I um, figured out how to make the Electret microphone, using one right now, and so are you if you have a cell phone because it's in all cell phones. Um, uh, we, it, it was not clear to either of us that we had an invention. And why? Because the microphone already existed. Who needs another microphone? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out to be a very, very important microphone because your cell phone would not work with any other microphone, unfortunately. And the reason for that <laughs> is that coding is used in cell phones so that many, many people can, can um, uh, use the system. And when, if, if there are any nonlinearities at all in the microphone, this gets amplified in the crosstalk from the compression algorithm that uh, they have. So, um, and I think I'm getting close to the end here and answering your uh, question. Uh, the only uh, thing that's missing here is the euphoric feeling when you know you've got something. When you know that you have found something that no one else has found. So it makes you a very unique person, and that's a real great feeling when you get to, uh, in the, to that position. And I'm, very yeah, cool. Yeah. Susie, how about from your experience? Tell us again, sort of the paths not taken or the failures, okay. and then that, that euphoric moment if you add it. Yes. Um, oh, oh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Made all the better by all the torture that happened before. So I, I, you know, I, uh, I am a computer scientist by education, by uh, career. Um, and so I'm, I didn't start out to be an inventor, if you will. Um, I joined Qualcomm 24 years ago, and in late 1996, I was working on um, our base station uh, software, and uh, uh, I made an observation. It wasn't a brilliant observation, but uh, with a team of people, my background before Qualcomm was in um, the computer industry. I'd actually worked for Xerox, and I'm a retreaded Ethernet programmer. And so my observation was this voice link, this CDMA voice link, is just bits. It's just ones and zeros. So why don't we send data over it? And uh, that was not just just my observation. That there were a couple other people in the company who. Um, were really understood the promise of being able to do wireless data, and so out of that came uh, came a, I invented a very simple way to do mobile what we call mobile originated um, packet data calls, and that resulted um, in early '97 with the first I'm very proud of this with the first um, web surfing on this phone. <laughs> On this display, and at the CTA, at the trade show to CTIA '97, <laughs> and it was such a big hit. Even though you know you will all laugh at this little display, it was it was such a powerful demo that um, the infrastructure makers, and the phone makers, and uh, Qualcomm, really by by the next year, our CEO was actually surfing the web from Maui in a in a phone that we commercialized. And so one thing I want to say about that, that process is, uh, is it, it's never a single person. You build, on, you build on the work of people who have gone before you. Um, you have to have creativity and, you also, and curiosity, and you also have to have um, the, the ability to think out of the box, the ability to make these observations, which has served me well in my career as well as my inventions, the, the ability to make these observations that maybe I can do something different with this, uh, with this stream of ones and zeros. And, um, and perhaps more importantly than you know, surfing the web on this little display itself is that that really gave rise to the industry's interest and Qualcomm's interest in um, we, we surfed at 13 kilobits, which was the speed of the, the fast uh, voice encoder and decoder. 
and uh, now you're, you know, you can download a vi video over gigabit LTE at gigabit rates. And so it was these kinds of inventions that um, really spur uh, others on to build on that platform. And so if you look at 3G and 4G and 5G, it's all about how fast, how efficiently, you know, with great response time, you can actually send, send data. And so, and that, that euphoric moment, there is nothing like that euphoric moment because, because the lows are really low too. <laughs> uh, but when, when we got the packet data d demo working, in, uh, it was like November of 96, um, the first thing you do in a small, smallish company is you send the first call or you send the, you know, the first uh, data message to your CEO. And so we sent it to Erwin Jacobs, there were about four of us, and uh, he says, great, congratulations. Can you demo it for the analysts and the shareholders on Tuesday? <laughs> so we all had to go out and buy a suit. And we all had to work all weekend to get the, get the demo working, and it, and it worked. And it was, it was one of those euphoric right. moments. Right. So uh, what, what was that first message? You know, is it, Watson, come here, I need you? <laughs> no, I think it was, hi, Dr. Jacobs. This is coming to you Look. over your CDMA link. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Um, Adam, Adam, I want to shift gears here a little and just kind of ask you big picture, and you, you may find some more specifics to burrow in, but thinking back over the 200 years, what has been the role of the patent system to the innovation engine, to the American economy? Right, it's a great question, and um, you know, patents are not, of course, the be-all and end-all, but they are a key component of a you know, thriving, growing innovation economy and a flourishing society. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln, the very famous president, of course, uh, very few people don't know he was actually an inventor. He was yep. the only U.S. president to receive a patent. Um, and he actually identified the U.S. patent system as one of the three great human achievements um, in history. And he famously said of it that, you know, it provided the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. Um, and, and that's what you see throughout history, and you hear the stories uh, from Susie and, and, and Jim and others about how you know, they're, you know, they invent, right? Um, and then the, pa the patent system doesn't inspire them per se to invent, but the patent system then provides the means to take those cool ideas you came up in with the lab and, 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 uh, and at the university and figure out how to get those into the real world, into the hands of consumers, right? Because you heard, you know, what, Susie, you, what, the message you sent to Dr. Jacobs was not, you know, sent in the same way and on the same uh, device that ultimately a person would have, a consumer on the street would have in their phone. And a lot of secondary innovation has to go into that uh, by business persons, follow on inventors, the inventors themselves have to work on it. And, um, and that's what the US patent system has provided because you, you, know, you see consistently when you read the stories of Samuel Morse, the inventor of the telegraph, and we now know as Morse code. By the way, today is a very auspicious anniversary. Today is the anniversary of Samuel Morse receiving his patent in 1840 on his invention of the telegraph um, and, and Morse code, uh, which he patented as well, uh, which he invented. Um, and uh, last Friday was the anniversary of Charles Goodyear receiving in 1844 his, his patent on his process for making rubber, a stable and effective commodity to be used by businesses and consumers. Um, that their patents were the means by which they got their inventions out of their homes and literally their garages into the hands of consumers through the business persons. And, and that's really been a key part of how the American patent system has served such a fundamental role in our innovation economy for the past 200 years. And Drew, tell us from your perspective, you know, what has stayed constant, what has changed about the patent office and the role of the patent commissioner? All right, um, so let me, let me uh, start with the role, role of the commissioner, I guess. Um, I, I think my role uh, is primarily um, to make sure that the examiners are ready to do their job. So it's an examiner's job to get a, a patent application in. Uh, it's their job to know the technology, uh, which can be challenging because obviously with inventions it's new technology but to know the challenge, uh, know the technology, and also to know the laws that apply and be able to um, issue those patents and say this, you know, this is deserving of a patent, uh, and to, to not issue ones that aren't deserving. Uh, they're, they're the gatekeepers, so to speak, uh, of the system. 
Um, I think that is without a doubt primarily my role. Um, and I believe that's been the role of every head, you know, every commissioner or uh, people at the office uh, dating, dating back to when, uh, when examination really started. So that uh, principle ha hasn't changed at all. I think what's changed the most is the size of, of the office, and that says a lot about the inventiveness of, of, uh, of America. So uh, we get uh, uh, about 600,000 patent applications filed in a year which is a staggering number. Uh, to be able to go through those applications, we have over 8,000 patent examiners, and they're all separated into different technologies. So you can have somebody in, uh, in, a, in a, looking at screw threads, and that's all they do. Or you can have somebody looking uh, in biotechnology, and they're a very hardworking, very challenging job, um, but, but that is the bulk of what they do. When we look back just 50 years ago, and this gets to your question about change, just 50 years ago, um, the number of examiners was different by a factor of 10. So we had about um, 800 examiners just 50 years ago. And, and that's stating more about the inventiveness of, of society uh, and, and inventors building on other inventions than it is more about the office. So that's interesting. I, I understand you yourself came up through the ranks as a patent examiner. What would you say to someone who's in the audience who's thinking, huh, okay, I've, I'm not gonna become an inventor, but I'm really interested in this. I might wanna become a patent examiner. Like, what, what makes a good patent examiner? What do you say to excite people about it? Oh, no, <laughs> that, that, thanks, that's a, that's a great question. I, I actually never envisioned that I was going to be either a patent lawyer or a patent examiner. Um, when I eventually decided to go to law school, um, I, I had two examiners in a law school class with me, and it was a patent prosecution class. And I remember being so impressed at how much they knew about the patent system that I thought, I, I want to go to the office and learn like an examiner learns. And, and that was what brought me to the office. And never did I imagine 24 years I, I'd, you know, later I'd be, I'd be sitting here. But it's a fabulous job. It is uh, extremely challenging, right? As I mentioned, you've got to know law and technology. But it's also extremely gratifying. Um, you get to come to work every day. And you make your decisions, and this is what the allure for me was you know, back in, in the mid-90s when I came to the office. You get to come to work every day and make the decision based on what you think is the right thing to do. And I know that sounds like a very simple statement, but that's what an examiner does. They look at, they evaluate the invention, they understand it, they know the laws, and they say, is, is this deserving or not? And if it's not, maybe there's a way that they can help the applicant uh, so that they can get a patent. And it can be very gratifying to help the process move forward so these wonderful inventors, like I have up on the podium with me and, and, and number 10 million uh, sitting, sitting in the front row, it could be extremely gratifying to be able to, um, to, be able to help a, a product get to market, you know, get the patent um, from, from the work that you put in behind that. And it's just really wonderful. When, when, when both of you talked about your euphoric moment, uh, examiners sit around, and I've done this myself, and we talk about, hey, I just saw something, I, you know, I just saw one of my inventions in a trade magazine, or I was walking in one, you know, a store, and you saw it there, that's a great feeling. We're not the inventors ourselves, but if we help the process, that, that feels right. great. Right, very cool. Um, Susie, you know, if, if I look back at the 19th century, it was really an era, of course, of really independent inventors, sole inventors, largely. Um, over the course of the 20th century, um, industrial R&D, research and development, grew. Companies put a lot of money into, and of course, science shifted where it took larger labs, larger groups of people in many cases. I just wonder, from your perspective, what's been the role of corporate R&D in our innovation economy? Um, I think you cannot underestimate the, um, the role of uh, corporations in the innovation economy. The, these technologies, and I can only speak for you know, the, tech, the tech area and a few of the related areas, but these technologies are so complex that it's not, again, it's not like Benjamin Franklin can fly a kite in a thunderstorm. And it's, it's not one single person that can come up with some aha moment. And it takes tremendous investment uh, on the part of a corporation and, and an individual, and typically individuals don't have that kind of investment. Um, so it takes tremendous in investment by a corporation like Qualcomm, who is looking for being around in the long term and is willing to invest in people like me uh, and engineers and uh, researchers and prototypers to um, 
to be able to uh, engineer and, and come up with these kinds of in, inventions so that they can, uh, they can uh, reap the financial benefits in the long term. And it's, it's far, far from guaranteed. You know, it's far from guaranteed personally. We have a lot of lows personally. Sometimes we say, why did we ever start this project? Uh, um, and it's also for the, for the company, there's a huge amount of risk in, um, in taking on some of these, um, these innovation, innovative uh, technologies. And so um, I think corporations, um, especially those that are looking at the long term, serve a, an incredibly important um, function in you know, American innovation by investing in people who are going to invent, and then also by partnering with the, the patent office to protect those inventions. If, whether you're an individual or you're a corporation, if you, and especially if you're a corporation, if you don't think that your invention is that you patented, that you are licensing to get it out into the world, um, if you don't think that that can be protected by a patent, then there is not much incentive for you to spend all that money to actually, um, you know, hire researchers, hire engineers, and and go down these very risky paths. So um, I I don't know what the statistics are, um, but I would I wouldn't be surprised if many many of the uh, you know very valuable innovation patents actually come out come through corporations and. People think of corporations as these big bad places, but corporations are, are me, right? And uh, corporations is nothing but a set of, uh, of uh, people trying to push the technology and the world forward. Yeah, yeah. So Jim, you, uh, you worked for many years at a place that really is beginning to have almost mythical status among historians of science and technology. Almost. Well, okay. <laughs> Real mythical status. So this is Bell Labs. Um, which was famous for really kind of unfettered discovery, but then perhaps towards the end wasn't as good at what Susie was just pointing to of needing to actually generate commercial products. But actually I wanted to ask you about is kind of your shift then to Johns Hopkins. So looking across universities, corporations, what are similarities, what are differences in them as places to do your research and inventing? Well, there are probably a hundred answers to those uh, questions, but let me see if I can narrow it down to a precious few. Um, Bell Laboratories is truly a mythical place, and it was mythical because of the governing rules around it. Uh, I couldn't lock my door, right? It had to always be open. That means if somebody in chemistry wanted to know something that I knew, we were free to exchange, and, and so the mixture, and, and uh, as Susan po pointed out, collaborative research, collaborative efforts are the key and have been for a very long time. I chose Johns Hopkins because it looked more like Bell Labs than any other university that I interviewed. And it looked more like Bell Labs because its main emphasis is on medical delivery systems on, on cures, on how technology can aid in healthcare. Uh, I had a meeting with uh, Mr. Peterson, who was president of Johns Hopkins Hospital at that time, which is ranked number, I don't know, three or four in, in the world. Uh, he credits technology for the position that Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, has, right? And um, uh, the, 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 this leads right up to one of uh, my recent um, uh, projects. Um, pneumonia is the biggest cause of infant mortality in the world. Two million peop uh, kids lose their lives every year due to, to pneumonia. And it's not, it's a curable disease. The problem is in detecting it. We don't have enough physicians to go around to, to monitor the lung condition of, of, of infants. And so one of, uh, it's not an invention yet because it's still in the patent office on, under, <laughs> under review, but uh, we're hopeful. Uh, and, but, the, but what we can do is detect pneumonia in lungs in 10 seconds, okay? 
And it's on a very inexpensive device, which means that it can go throughout the world. Uh, Third World is very interested in this technology, and we hope that it will indeed save some lives. So the transition from industry to university was not always as smooth as I had hoped it would. Uh, at Bell Laboratories, uh, I could, um, uh, at, at lunch, turn the napkin or the place plate over and two or three of us will sit around and work for a couple of hours and say I needed um, $100,000 to do the experiment. Uh, check was on my desk. Uh, right now, I spend half my time looking for <laughs> funds to pay my students, and, and this is very uncomfortable. And the system that we have to really address in this country and learn how to do it better, because this is clearly not one of our best working uh, uh, areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drew, do you have a comment on kind of the different roles and whether it fits together or points of tension among you know, the university-based invention, the corporate. We still have independent inventors in America, and of course, there's a huge swath, um, and in fact, Patent 10 million reflects this of kind of government or military-based R&D that in today's era, very nicely, because they're motivated to get patents, again, becomes public. It's no longer as hidden or secretive in that way. Sure, I, 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 from my perspective, I don't see that there's a you know, stronger path from all those options you mentioned. Um, we do have many independent inventors and independent inventors lead to startup businesses and, and can make extremely significant changes um, to, to society and, and, and helping society. So from our perspective, um, we see inventions from, from all areas and we actually have uh, recently started a, a group of examiners to focus solely on inventors who don't have attorneys as their representative, so they're going through the patent process by themselves. And the whole idea there is that where they don't have the training to, to write a patent application and know what needs to go into that, uh, we help them along so that we can foster uh, their innovation. So I, I believe that, that there, there's innovation coming from all sectors, and I think that's what, what makes America great. Um, I will say I, I, I've been very fortunate to, to have many interactions with universities and, and while I, I completely you know, agree that more work needs to be done, I think universities are, are starting to get that and they're starting to, to really have their um, engineers, uh, one, work with their business schools, um, two, be more familiar with inventions and, and what will happen in the future. So um, I, I, I think we're in a great place and I, and I think there's always improvement to be made, but I believe there's inventions coming from all sectors um, and that's what makes us great. So Adam, the patent number one million was issued in 1911, patent five million in 1991. So that's 80 years, so it takes 20 years per million patents. Mm -hmm. The nine millionth patent was 2015, so at that point you're talking about six years per million patents. And now it's three years later, we're at patent 10 million. So what's behind that acceleration? Is it just population growth? <laughs> um, lots of factors. Of course, one of them is, I think, yes, population growth, more inventors, more people inventing. Um, but the, you know, the, the, you know, we are increasingly an innovation-driven economy. And, um, <clears throat> and we, in fact, had two massive revolutions in the last half of the 20th century that were primarily driven by the patent system. And that was the, uh, the digital revolution uh, behind our computers. Jack Kilby and Bob Noyce coming up with the integrated circuit in 1959, the transistor at Bell Labs in the 1940s. These were all in innovations that were patented, were heavily invested in very long time horizons, as, as Susie described, and then ultimately you know, put into place by follow-on innovators and developers. And then the digital technology was combined, of course, with the pharmaceutical revolution of the, of the earlier 20th century and produced what we now call the biotech revolution, which is the combination of high tech with biopharmaceutical innovation. So we get such amazing innovations, as, as Jim has described, as the, the stethoscope that can detect pneumonia within a few seconds. Um, <clears throat> and this is all innovation that is being secured and driven by our patent system primarily. Um, you know, of course, you can protect things through 
through trade secrecy and other things, but these are uh, a lot of these innovations are innovations that require the kind of the, the secure property rights the patents provide as the basis for contracts and licensing arrangements and and all of the things that you need to get the things into the hands of consumers, especially deployed around the world and, and into the developing world. Um, and I think that those two those two mass revolutions that kind of came together, which really made our life. In, a veritable miracle today. I mean, it's really, as an historian, you really do appreciate like how much we take for granted today. Uh, you know, things that we do now that were thought of as impossible or you know, pure science fiction 15 or 20 years ago, right? I, um, and I, when I first met Susie, I, I had a little Wayne's World moment. I was like, I'm not worthy. When I started so that she worked on the Ethernet in the 1970s at Xerox Park, uh, and you know, I was just like, oh my God, that's so amazing, um, and. Um, you know the you know and if you had said to us in the 1980s you know that we would be have computers in our pockets that we call phones yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that are actually more powerful than the computers on our desks people we would look at you like you're crazy you're insane and yet that's actually an early space today. shuttles and yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> um, and um, and so this is you know the I think this is this is part and parcel of what's kind of led to this explosion in innovation. I mean, and, and there's a general correlation between you know patenting, you know, the amounts of patents that are coming out and the growth in the innovation economy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a general, and it's a correlation that holds fairly constant historically and across countries. Yeah. So when we look at historically at inventors, um, historians love to find the quotes where the inventor is most frustrated with the patent office yes. or receiving a patent, and there's some legendary quotes from people who ultimately became incredibly successful inventors. Um, there's you know, an amazing story about Bell in inventing and patenting the telephone, of being so concerned about his ideas being stolen that he in fact sealed one of the telephones in a tin box, which he then deposited at the Smithsonian. Um, he in fact left two um, to be opened in case of contested litigation in court. There was in fact challenges one of them was opened. We still have the other one unopened because we're the Smithsonian. Um, but I, I want to ask you about the experience as an inventor dealing with the patent office or with patent attorneys. What was that like? How did it change how you do work? Did it kind of give you a clue like in the future, here's how I should change my research? Or how, what's the, kind of that relationship like as an inventor? Well. Um, I had to learn a whole new language when my, my first first patent. Uh, you know, process is that uh, you do something, then you write it up, and then for scientists, the next step is to publish. But generally, companies don't allow you to publish until the intellectual property is uh, in in place. And so, my first patent, I, I wrote what I thought was a very nice, clear memo. When I got the patent back, I couldn't understand anything that was there without a dictionary because there were words that I'd never seen, never heard before. So that was a little bit frustrating, a little bit aggravating, uh, but uh, things have changed, fortunately, uh, where we both now kind of speak the same language, and, and that's really important because then translations are, are un unnecessary. Um, the patent, uh, I can, if I have time, yeah. tell one yeah. little story. Uh, one of my early patents uh, was uh, challenged. And so the uh, attorney at Bell Labs says, we've got to go to, to Washington and straighten that patent attorney out. It's probably some old, <laughs> no, he's, th those old geezers down there don't know what they're doing. It's modern world. <laughs> and so, um, and, and he prepared me, says, you've got to be forceful. You've got to fight for, for, for what you want. So we came down to the patent office and went in to see the patent examiner who turned out to be a 25-year-old female. So. It was easy from that point on, from my standpoint. We didn't have to fight so hard. Uh, she was very reasonable and understood what we were saying. But the patent, my patent attorney had a totally different view of the patent department than I did. But I think he got caught in a transition too. Susie? So I'm, I'm really happy, Jim, that you said you didn't understand what your first patent had turned into because I looked back recently at one of mine and I thought, did I, did I write that? <laughs> Maybe it's just the age. But um, uh, I think uh, in a, 
my experience is a little bit different um, because I'm an engineer, not a scientist, and so the goal, as you're writing, writing patents, the goal is to commercialize and to get the product out, um, out the door. And so there's always that pressure. Um, and also inside of, um, inside of a company like Qualcomm, you typically have a, a group of patent attorneys who have been trained as engineers, and so they help you translate you know, your engineering write-up into the sort of the legal patent um, write-up that will eventually go be, uh, be um, filed. And, uh, but even that process is, is tough and a little mysterious because as, as, uh, you know, as you're writing this, this patent, and then also as you're sending, you, send, you file for it and it, you're not sure it's going to get granted, and we, like in my experience, I, I never actually interacted directly with the patent examiners. Um, and so in my mind, uh, they were also, they were a combination of these, you know, scary people up in an ivory tower with halos on. And you don't look like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but um, but it, it, uh, it's, it's also, it, it's hard when people especially are, are starting out writing patents. Um, I'm really happy to hear that the, the actual, the patent office actually has now classes for individual um, inventors who don't have the benefit of a Qualcomm department um, behind them. Because uh, as, a, as an engineer or a scientist, especially when you're just starting out writing patents, you know, this is your baby. You put tons of hours and blood and sweat and your, you and your colleagues have labored over this thing and then, you know, the patent examiners are gonna tear it all to pieces. And it's, uh, it's really a kind of an interesting look at sort of your own ownership of that uh, invention. But it's, it's really good because it forcus, fo forces you to focus on, well, it's not just your baby, you know, can you make this ap applicable to a, broad, to a broad audience? Drew, I would love to chime in. Exactly. Yeah. No, so, so if you want to try something really challenging, right, just pick, pick anything, right, could be the chair you're sitting on, pick, pick some device and, and get with three people and try to describe it in words. Right, and you'll see how differently you've all you all do this, um, and that is a challenge. And so, at the heart of the the, the system, when when a, you know an, an attorney or an agent is writing up a patent application, um, their job is to put this invention and often a very very complex invention into words, and then it's it's our job at the office to make sure that the, there's there's parts of the application called the claims in the end that they describe the invention. That's what's going to the, be the protection of that patent. So if those words are not accurately describing the invention, both in terms of, of the scope, in other words, what is entitled to invention, there's a problem, right? If, if, if the examiner issues a patent that is much more narrow than the inventor was entitled to, uh, that's a problem. The inventor is not getting their whole benefit of their invention. By the same token, if they issue something that's too broad, right, then the examiner, I mean, then the uh, applicant might overuse it or it might get challenged and it might not with, withstand a legal challenge. So there's this Goldilocks uh, portion that they have to hit in the middle and just get it right, and that's, that's what the challenge is. Um, I, I do believe that, that you know, I, I, I heard you talking about not meeting inventors, and I hear that all the time, or not meeting examiners, and we hear that all the time. Um, what, what we try to foster at, at the Patent and Trademark Office is sitting down with the examiner, right? And, and I always joke and I say with property, it's location, location, location. With a patent application, it's interview, interview, interview. Sit down, get on the same page, get together, mm -hmm. um, and have those discussions. And what I often see is an examiner and, 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 and an attorney are just talking past each other. And when they can sit down together, they can, they can usually work something out. And, and when they understand each other, there's always a better course of action. Um, that moves forward, and um, it, it's, 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 I'm not gonna say it's easy um, to go through the patent process, it's definitely challenging. Anything challenging is gonna be, you know, it, it, anything worthwhile is gonna be challenging, and uh, I, I think it can be done, it can be done in a way of working together, and, and that's the goal. Adam, when you look at the history that you've studied in some considerable depth, I mean, do you have an example of an inventor who kind of flipped, who went from, oh my God, dealing with this is dealing with the, the, not the halo, but the horns <laughs> to the halo. Um, well, there, uh, and it, 
a good example of that, although it's after the patent issued, right, is Alexander Graham Bell, the, in, the inventor of the telephone. Um, he, uh, um, he actually became very upset with his, his, with his patent attorneys during the litigation, during when his patents were challenged. Um, all, all great patents are eventually challenged. Um, all great new technologies eventually end up in court because that's the way we resolve disputes. I mean, there's very oftentimes there's questions about sometimes who was the first inventor, but even there's just honest disputes between people who are, who are trying to create competing products and the way we resolve disputes in our, in our country and around the world is through courts. Um, and um, he, was, he, he had a certain idea about what his invention was, mm -hmm. represented in one of the claims, and his attorney said, no, 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 it's, it's actually this other claim, it was called Claim 5, that's what we're going to win on. And he completely disagreed with his attorney and he wrote all of these letters, which are often sometimes shared by patent skeptics about how, oh, the attorneys are destroying my invention and the patent is being warped and twisted and it doesn't reflect my great innovation, but his attorneys actually were ultimately correct. I mean, they won the case. It went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court in very famous decision um, and, um, and secured his, his rights to his invention on his attorney's arguments and, and he came to see that his attorneys were right. So they can work together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, when you do talk to patent law, uh, attorneys, and particularly, uh, they're called patent prosecutors. Those are the, the lawyers who help uh, apply for patents, who write the patent applications. You know, they play a very important role in kind of defining what is that innovation that you've created and transmitting that, that innovation into, uh, into language that not just other attorneys understand, but also other people in the, or throughout the world under, can understand and read and benefit from. Yeah, there's a kind of public perception that inventors are these kind of lone geniuses who wake up in the middle of the night with this, this flash of an idea. And you know, actually sometimes that's true, but the inventions we have in our hands, the products that get to market, have actually been through a quite disciplined process of building prototypes, of testing, of refining, of securing intellectual property, of developing a market. And so it's easy to kind of mix the two. And there is a kind of interesting question about the inventors who succeed most at continuing to get patents, how their kind of invention style is changing over time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to ask a, a question yet, uh, and we are going to open up for general discussion so people can begin to think about what they might want to ask. Um, there's been a, a whole spate of studies recently from historians and economists kind of looking at some of the challenges faced by women and minority inventors especially, um, that they tend to get fewer patents, um, they're often under-resourced as inventors, they're not getting that. Um, how do we encourage a broader populace to invent? How do we get, you know, how do we close the gap? Right. Well, let's look at one thing a little bit ahead of that question and why this is important. It turns out that many studies have been made that have shown that diverse work groups and technology are the most productive. This is underrepresented minorities and especially women infused into, into the process. So I just wanted to yeah. set that, set the stage. Um, uh, I was born in Virginia many, many years ago, and I went to uh, segregated schools and the whole thing. My initial university experience was at a black uh, HBCU. Uh, and this world is not necessarily open to the public. When my father was very upset with me when I switched from uh, pre-med to physics. And the reason he was upset was because the only professions that black people had at that time were preacher, teacher, lawyer, doctor. And if you weren't one of those, you weren't professional. Mm. Well, things have changed, but there's a lag here. And th this lag is, is one that, bothers, that worries me very much. And an and area that I'm also trying to contribute to making things a little bit better. Uh, we're often counseled away from technology. We're often counseled away from mathematics, which is the foundation for all science. Um, and once we get in our minds, and, and I've heard many parents and, and challenged many parents who sit around and said, well, my son or daughter can't do math, but I couldn't either. That's not a good message to be sending to your children. 
The message should be, you can do it because you can. And that's one thing that we have to overcome. This is not only true for underrepresented minorities, it's especially true for women. Uh, your place is not in the laboratory, uh, you know, has been the mantra of this country, of the world for that matter, for a long, long time. So the ladder is steep to get started. We are making progress, but unfortunately not fast enough. And the real crux of the problem is that if you lump all of the underrepresented minorities, you're talking about maybe 25% of the population of this country. But that same population represents only 5% of the STEM workforce. Women are 51% of the population of this country, but less than 15% of the STEM workforce. Well, until we get people into this Mm -hmm. career, until we encourage them that this is a career, this is a place to go, we're going to always lag unless we get those numbers up. Because everybody can't be an inventor, but people can support in inventions. And, and this is as important. I, I mean, the people that worked for me at Bell Labs and, the, and my students now are, are my heart. They, they're the ones that make me. And, and it's really, really very important to bring this new group on board. I have three underrepresented minority graduate students in my, in my group now. So I'm doing my part. I know others who are trying, but you have to do, when I say you, I'm talking about the women and the underrepresented minorities in this audience, you have to do your job too, because you have to condition your kids to understand that you can make a living in technology, that this is an area that you can go to school for four years and come out and earn a real decent salary. And believe me, in this country, there are not too many other areas that you can do that in. Yeah. Susie, I know you also do a fair bit of mentoring and work with uh, young people. Yeah, and um, geez, I'm, I'm not sure I can, how I can match Jim's comments here, but um, I just have to um, agree. I, I think culturally, whether you're female or you're a minority, uh, historically, you've been discouraged for going into the, from going into these kinds of uh, STEM fields, if you will, uh, engineering um, and math and technology and, and science. And uh, I, I think there's big cultural biases still in place. But on the positive side, I see tremendous programs that are in place for encouraging um, kids to go into these kinds of fields. Um, I see the, the maker movement. I love the maker movement because I think it harnesses, um, it, it harnesses kids and Adam's and my <laughs> natural uh, tendencies to you know, create uh, Fun, fun things, and they don't always have to be just fun. A lot of them end up, be, I think, being uh, inventions and going into products. Um, the Hall of Fame, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, but the um, Patent and Trade Office has uh, a Hall of Fame. They have phenomenal programs called Camp Invention for, uh, for kids. And then Qualcomm, I have all the props. Um, so Qualcomm has a program we call the Think a Bit Lab. And it's targeted towards uh, underrepresented um, middle schoolers in the STEM area. And uh, it's really trying to show these, um, these kids it's, it's free, it's non-competitive, because if you put, uh, I love a good competition, you start to make kids uh, compete before they're ready, and you can just watch them shut down. And so it uh, aims to uh, inspire kids to be the future in inventors and to get them to look at careers, any careers, not even just being an inventor, but uh, any careers in the um, STEM area. So this is, um, and we teach them a little bit about IoT. <laughs> and I had a professor, you know, observe the program one time and come out and said, say to me, I actually know what IoT you know, means now. Uh, <laughs> so we teach them a little bit about IoT and then we turn them loose on the craft wall. And this is an example of what some of these kids come up with. It's not a kit, there's not a prescribed outcome, it's not a competition. And so these kids, this is two sixth graders, I believe they were sixth grade girls, and they made an invention of their own need. And this is a machine that dresses you in bed. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they say these are the, the sensors um, that sense in the pile of clothes in, uh, in your room, which, which are dirty and which are clean. Mm -hmm. They dress you in bed, and then they program a little Arduino board um, here uh, themselves, and it turns a servo, and the servo has a makeup pad on it, and this is the machine that dresses you in bed and puts your makeup on in bed. And it's, it's really fun, but the point, the point is, is there are phenomenal programs out there for, for kids, um, and adults, uh, that if we don't take advantage of them, then people will continue to think, oh, that's not a field for me. I, I had one of the, we participate also in FIRST Robotics, and I had one of the um, uh, coaches say to me that the biggest reason uh, girls and minorities drop out of FIRST programs is not financial, it's not time, it's because the parents don't understand it. The parents don't give the positive feedback at home. So I think as Jim mentioned earlier in the program, encourage your kids to be creative and to make things. And they don't, they aren't necessarily going to become the next, you know, Thomas Edison or, or, or Jim, um, but they will have some very, very good job opportunities in, and very interesting job opportunities in these kinds of fields. So Drew, yeah, I mean, yeah. the in Inventors Hall of Fame was mentioned. I know USPTO has other programs as well to kind of stimulate the next generation. Sure, and, and um, first of all, I, I, I thank both of you for your, for your remarks and, 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 and agree with the uh, idea that ed it's all about education. And I, I mentioned before that, you know, my main role as Commissioner for Patents is to make sure that the examiners are ready to, to do their job of examination. A very, very important role that we have at USPTO is to educate and, and to foster outreach. And so we have an Office of Education, we have an Office of Innovation Development, all geared towards reaching out to um, people to educate them. And many programs with, with children, uh, many programs uh, with women. We have a women's symposium that we put on. Um, and, and I will also just say we need more role models, right? The, the more role models we can have, uh, the better. Uh, as mentioned a number of times, the National Mentors Hall of Fame, uh, we do partner with them. Uh, they do a wonderful job of, of putting out um, these great inventors as role models and saying these are the superstars, these are the superheroes uh, for the kids to emulate. And, uh, and I think it's, you know, this is a, a wonderful way to go. Uh, I will say at USPTO, I'm very proud of the fact that, that uh, over 40% of the executives um, um, in my area are, are, are women, um, and, and I think that is, it will help um, set role models and, 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 and set us on a better course for the future, but certainly it's something we need to continue um, to be focused on. I would be remiss when you showed your prop, if I can just take two seconds to talk about what I believe, and I'm sorry if I remember this right, I believe it was a, a young girl who invented this at an event I was at, and, but I'm not 100% sure, but definitely a young kid. I believe she, she was, was a young girl. She invented a collar uh, to control her dog better because her dog wasn't listening to her. And so she could press a button remotely that would put a bacon smell out to the left <laughs> or a bacon smell out to the right. Very important. To me. That's, just, you just, that's just wonderful. I wanted to get one myself for me. But. Can I, Adam, um, Adam. I, I just want to add a, a slightly historical perspective. And, um, there are very profound and profoundly uh, fundamental questions at the social, cultural, and political level that you know we have to grapple with as a society, and all societies must grapple with. Um, not, the, and it's not the job of the patent system to address that, but the patent system can help facilitate that um, by being what the United States patent system has been, which is, in, and economic historians refer to this as the democratization of invention, so that it's accessible and open to all individuals. So very early on, the court said, you know, the, that you, 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 in your opening remarks, Arthur, you, met, you quoted from the Constitution, it says the word inventor. It said anyone can be an inventor. It doesn't matter it, uh, where you're from, your, your, your socioeconomic class, your race, your gender, your nationality. If you invent, you get a patent. And so the US patent system was open to everyone um, uh, from a very early, uh, early stage. In fact, historians have found that there were African Americans who were slaves who invented, and the court said the patent has to go to the slave because the slave is the inventor. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and so this was a, you know, uh, an important 
like the small but nonetheless important kind of uh, leverage point to continue to challenge the prejudices and biases that existed in our culture at that time, our society more generally, and up through today. Um, and in fact, uh, Frederick Douglass uh, liked to talk about patents a lot. He talked about patents uh, surprisingly a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons why he did was because you know, he was challenging the bias and prejudice that African Americans weren't inventive, that they weren't creative. Mm -hmm. And he was constantly identifying and pointing to the hundreds and hundreds of patents that had already issued to African Americans um, as, ex as counter examples to that. You know, and so, for instance, last Thursday is the uh, anniversary of George Washington Carver, famous African American chemist who did work on peanuts. Um, many people know of him for that, but he actually got a patent in 1927. Uh, um, the anniversary, as I said, was last Thursday on another process of making paints and stains from clay. Um, and so, the, you know, m having a democratized invention system with patents that are available to all individuals, I think, is a key component to back up the very important social, cultural, and political uh, points that we always have to uh, uh, make and ensure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I may have my numbers a little, little wrong here, but I know that there are at least 30 underrepresented minority and 30 women inductees into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. If you want to find a role model, if you want to find out what women and underrepresented minorities have contributed to the improvement of the quality of life has suggests to go to the National Inventors Hall of Fame and look them up. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to ask one more question and then uh, we'll open up to some questions from the floor. Uh, so, you know, looking across that history, looking to the future, um, is there something unique about America as a place of invention? Do we continue that? How, what's your take on the future? What else is needed, if anything, to support us as a place of invention? Or are we kind of on autopilot from here? Drew, why don't Yeah, I'd be happy to address. I, I, <laughs> wow. I would never want to say we're on autopilot. Yeah. Um, I guess that's just more of a way of life than anything else. But I think there's always, uh, there's o should always be a focus on, on improving. Um, your question asks a lot, I mean, about what makes us unique. Um, I believe that what makes us unique is, is the combination of of having a system put in our constitution, having a very inventive society, um, I think having confidence in our patent system and and the the ability and and the enthusiasm to support that patent system has has made it work. And and as you've heard us all mention in some way, shape, or form, invention leads to more invention. And and I don't know who to attribute this phrase to, but I, I hear it very often about inventors standing on the shoulders of giants before them. And I think what has made us so unique is our inventive history that um, enables us to continue to build on those before us. And, and so I believe we are unique and I think that's been the driver, a, a key driver for the United States and it will continue to be. That being said, there's always areas to, to uh, improve. I think personally one area that, that uh, we are starting to focus on and will garner a lot more um, attention as we move forward is international harmonization. Um, patents are, are, and the patents, you know, systems are getting more global, protection is desired in multiple countries. Um, we now are, are just piloting programs where patent examiners in the U.S. will actually share their work with other examiners um, in other offices throughout the country. We're doing this with, with the Jap uh, Japan Patent Office and the Korean Patent Office and looking at it with other countries where they get together when they have similar applications, share the results, and then and they, they, and they go over the results before they even get back to the inventor. And I think there's a lot more that could be done to, that can be done to, to help foster um, a, a global perspective. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, I'd like to comment uh, on that too because I had an experience that, uh, that brought this whole thing home to me. Um, on a tour of, uh, of China, one of the places that I stopped was the city of Shenzhen and there I had an audience with the Minister of Technology. And he started his talk to me uh, uh, in, in the following way. Um, the United States 
is really a special place. In Silicon Valley, I can stand on any corner and see the world go by. And that the, the, uh, the diversity of our population is one of the things that makes us, um, uh, makes us inventive. And uh, he, uh, in fact, if you ever go to the city of Shenzhen, there's a park where all of the provinces of, of China are represented uh, in full. I mean, people really live there like they, did, like they do in these places. And the reason is he wants to attract as many, get as much diversity into the city of Shenzhen as he possibly can in order to improve their ability. So we have a tremendous asset. And this is one of the reasons that I'm so adamant about encouraging women and underrepresented minorities that they need to get in the game. Yeah. 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 Susie, do you have a comment on this, on looking at the future? Uh, um, I, you know, I, I think um, I'd just like to echo um, what Jim said and, and uh, Drew as well, is that um, this, this uh, spirit of inventiveness, if you will, and creating things and making things, has somehow been around for hundreds and hundreds of years in the, in the US. I think we do stand some risk of losing it if we don't, if we aren't more inclusive. And so, um, I, but I think, you know, I've worked a lot in, in Asia and I've worked some in, in Europe and other parts of the world and, uh, you know, wonderful experiences and wonderful diversity in some of these places, but you, you know, you see all that diversity here in DC, in Silicon Valley, any place in, in America, you see that diversity and you see working on STEM programs and working with, with young people, not just kids, you see this inherent um, desire to, to uh, this inherent crea creativity and curiosity and the desire to create something, whether it's, you know, sewing something or, or creating something with your hands. And I think that's somewhat unique in, in the US to be able to take that from, you know, creating something with your hands to, you know, writing a patent to being coming an inventor and always curious about what sort of the next thing is. And so it's hard to put my finger on it, but just culturally, I, I feel that the US has a very strong, um, a, a very strong uh, sense of uh, a sort of uh, community curiosity. And uh, we need to make sure that we don't lose th that, and we need to make sure that everybody gets a chance to participate in it. So, so Adam, every once in a while I read an article, it's probably about every five, maybe seven years, that says uh, you know, the returns from R&D investment are declining and we've captured all the low-hanging fruit and uh, it's over. <laughs> so tell me about the future. So, <laughs> I'm a historian. I can't make predictions about the future. <laughs> um, well, one, one thing is I, I, I want to just riff off of and reiterate the wonderful points already made by my co-panelists that um, you, know, you, you don't ever want to think of yourself an autopilot. Um, and um, you know, the, the patent system is a human artifact. And it can be changed and, and, un, and undermined and weakened just as much as it can be built up and, and, and strengthened. Um, and you know, for all of our faults in this country, um, you know, we you know we have had this what everyone has kind of identified this kind of inventive spirit. It's, it's something unique to the culture in this country. It it it, it fascinated the Europeans when we broke in the 19th century. Al, uh, Alex de Tocqueville talked about it specifically in his de famous uh, treatise Democracy in America in the 1830s about how Americans have this very kind of pragmatic orientation, to wanting they want to make their world better, and they're always trying to think of new ways to make their world better. And thankfully, we had a patent system which provided really stable, effective property rights to the innovators who said, you engage in this productive labor. Like a farmer creates a farm, you engage in that productive labor to create a new invention, whether it's the cotton gin, or the mechanized reaper, or the telegraph, um, the light bulb for Edison. Um, and we'll protect that to, for you just in the same way that historically a farmer has been protected in their farm. And that has been a fundamental to, uh, you know, to incentivizing people to want to create and then helping them move those creations into the marketplace. Um, and we need to be very careful uh, not to take that for granted. Um, if we want to continue to move forward and to continue to have the types of innovations that we've been talking about and that Sue and Jim have, have, have created and have contributed to our amazing lives today. We have to continue to make sure that we 
you know, promote and defend a stable and effective patent system that, uh, that Drew and his ex examiner corps uh, can effectively ensure to in the innovators that they will have their inventions secured to them. Wonderful, wonderful. So, um, yeah, we wanted to give a chance for questions from the audience. Um, I'm not sure if we have a wireless mic. We do. Okay, so um, right here, this young lady. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, it's been a truly honor and privilege to hear from you today. Thank you so much. My first question is for Sue and Jim as inventors. Um, I'm an economist, so I know that if I don't do my job right, I might lose my job or I might get reprimanded. Maybe you can speak a little bit more about your lows, like what happens when you keep <laughs> trying to get an invention. It might take a month or it might take 10 years. Like, How do you deal with those lows? And my other question right. is for Drew. I, as an economist, I did some math, so it's about six patents a month for one patent examiner. So how did you manage to get the 10 10 million yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> You're a mathematician, so <laughs> you've already done the STEM thing. So I, just from um, my point of view, as I sort of alluded to before, these these projects, when you're in engineering in a company like Qualcomm, these projects are never a single person. Even packet data, the first packet data was not a single person project. You're working on top of technology that other folks um, built. You're working with your colleagues. The, the lows can be really low in this, in this industry, but it only makes the highs higher. <laughs> because in the, in the it, you know, in the tech industry, everything is schedule driven. Everything is schedule driven and it's also quality driven. And so there's huge pressure to, and there's also first mover advantage, which the patent system in innovation has a lot to do with. When you get a patent on something and you're able to share it, but you're also able to um, commercialize it and get it out there first, then not only your company, but the whole ecosystem benefits from that. So. You know, the projects are hard, they're complex. They, um, uh, you know, you have, you have bugs in your software that you, you know, you can't imagine how you're ever going to find and, and fix them. And nobody knows where it is. And there's six and a half million lines of C code in a, in a cellular modem. And you persevere and you work with your colleagues and you never give up. You never give up. And that's actually one of the things I dislike about the culture of, you know, let kids fail. In some ways, I believe in that, but in other ways, there, in many of these projects, there is not an option of failure. <laughs> you can't just go home and say, okay, we're not gonna launch that phone. <laughs> we're not gonna launch that product. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps the, the same is true when you're actually going out to, ma to make an invention. So, um, putting in that perseverance and, and, and taking that risk that sometimes these, um, these inventions and these products will not bring you or your company financial gain. It's, it's a huge risk. Um, and that's why we feel it's so important that we have a strong patent system to protect us, uh, that kind of investment. But then when it works, and that when you, you know, for me, I spent much of my career in, in software on the chipset side, when you show your mother the latest phone and you say, I, I had something to do with this, <laughs> that, there's no feeling like that. Yeah. Epic customer parties, too. Epic <laughs> customer parties. <laughs> Jim? Yeah. Um, my experience is a little bit different because um, I've been uh, mainly fundamental research, uh, basic research, uh, in most of uh, all of my career, for, for that matter. And um, uh, this is kind of interesting. A few days ago, I was talking with someone about a social problem, and I asked one question. How long have you been going down that road? So 25 years or so, that's the problem. Because see, one of the things that we know in technology is you don't chase the rabbit, right? Because, but, but you follow nature. And, and this is not a, a straight road. You can be looking for one thing, but nature says, hey, there's something going on over here that you need to take a look at. Now you may circle back around and, and find that solution, right? But in research, you, you cannot tie people to completing a project. It, it's not that kind of, 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 of an experience. 
On the other hand, every year at Bell Labs, I had to write what I call my how great I am statement. And if I didn't have a number of memos, or a number of patent applications or those things, I, I knew that I wouldn't last. So you, you adjust all of these parameters to make sure you can fill that page. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that you fill that page with something that's, uh, uh, that is good and that will have an advantage. Many, many things, uh, in fact, um, not too long ago, uh, we found technology that was something like 50 years old that was buried in the literature that someone had thought about 50 years ago. And we're thinking, this is a brand new idea. No, no, it isn't. And so now you go back and you see what the guy did 50 years ago. And now this gives you a foundation for which you can build on and improve that process if, if, uh, if possible. So uh, yeah, there are the highs and the lows. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and I appreciate the lows as well as I appreciate the highs. Because it, when it gets too low, it means I've got to turn around and go in a different direction because the one that I'm working on is not giving me what I want. So you, you've become the Buddha of inventors. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you do. There's it's no doubt about it. right? Right. Drew, did you want to comment on just the volume of patents? I mean, you sure. kind of answered it earlier by just saying how many more patent examiners you'd have today than 50 years ago, but. I, I'd be happy, happy to comment on that. I will also say, getting to the conversation we were just having um, about inventors, um, I do hear inventors all the time talk about the highs and the lows. Um, and, 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 and don't be afraid if something doesn't work. It might be a low. It's not necessarily failure. I think it's how we define failure. Um, but, but as role models um, uh, for all of us, I, I do hear inventors talk about you know, striving. St when you're striving for something and in, in the world of invention, you do have those peaks and valleys. And, and they're not, it seems to me, they're, they're, they're neither afraid of that um, nor worried about that. It's mm -hmm. part of the process uh, that they go through. And to me, that, that's something that's very special. I will also say something that stands out to me uh, about inventors is just I find they're so humble. It's just amazing to me that I meet people that have literally changed the world and you feel like you're just talking to somebody you met on the street and that to me is also why we're special. Um, and, and, and I have yet to see how people who make those big changes can be so humble, but yet they are and that, that always impresses me. Um, to the numbers question, uh, we, we, I just checked my, uh, to see if I had notes on the number of patents we issue a year, but, and I don't have it going back. Um, but the office has grown exponentially. As I said uh, uh, previously, in the last 50 years, we went from needing 800 examiners to needing 8,000 to be able to do the volume of cases. Uh, the 10 million represents 10 million from the start of our, of our system. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a celebration of the inventors, it's a celebration of, of the attorneys, and a celebration of the examiners and everyone involved in, in the system. Right now we're issuing, I don't know where, how you got the six per examiner, but right now we're, we issue about 350,000 um, uh, patents a year at, at the current rate we're at. Um, the, the, the rate of filings uh, for us is on a steady increase almost year after year. So over in the last 20 years, there's been an increase in the number of new case filings, ranging from you know a few per, you know like a few tenths of a percentage all the way up to three or four percent, and that's been pretty steady. In the last 20 years, there's been only one year that didn't have an increase, and that was 2009 uh, when we were dealing with the financial crisis. Um, but other than that, there's been that steady increase. So 350,000 now will be less than three years before the next one million milestone uh, comes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm keeping my eye out whether there's a question yeah, there's on the one. internet because I know oh, we're webcasting, oh. but let's go with the gentleman with the hand up high right over here. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if it's going to make you feel better or worse, but regardless of what we look like, everyone has been discouraged from math. I can tell you that <laughs> as a math major and as the son of a PhD mathematician who is always asked, when, what do you do? He says he's a mathematician. And, and other people, is there anything left to do? Everybody has a calculator. What do you need to be a mathematician for? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, and we hear this over and over and over again. And I wonder if you have any thoughts as to why it is that in this society where no one would ever admit that they had difficulty reading, even if they did, it seems perfectly socially acceptable to say, oh, I was no good at math. I'll never be good at math. You shouldn't even try. Get your math requirements out of the way as quick as you can. 
Yeah, uh, that, that's a very good question. The only way that I can think to answer that is uh, when, when I encounter that problem, I, first question I ask, do you play music? And if the answer is yes, then I've got a hook. Because mathematics is just a different language, the same as the, 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 the scroll on, on the music scale is a language that you have to learn. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm not sure whether that helps or not, but I have had some young people come back and saying when I take that approach to math, it, I, I see it in a different light. The, one of the, but one of the major problems is that we teach mathematics in a vacuum. And mathematics does not belong in a vacuum. It's a universal phenomena. Yeah. And, and we, I, I think it's incumbent upon um, uh, those in mathematics to figure how to diversify these, these um, uh, 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 the, the mathematical process to have a real meaning. Um, I remember a long time ago when uh, we started a, um, a, a storefront a science center in a small town in New Jersey, and uh, we ran into the problem of counting, of, of just simple mathematics. But when we made it relative, here is a dollar. Um, I want you to go to the bodega down the street, and I want a bag of potato chips. And, um, and I want, and you can have half of whatever comes back, and I want you to tell me how much that was. And they can figure that out right on the spot mm -hmm. when you make it relative to something that they have had an experience with. Uh, other than that, I have no suggestions, except I agree that we have to turn the attitude toward math around. Because if our parents say math is great, guess what? Your children will probably agree with you. Until they're teenagers, and then they yeah. <laughs> oh, And then it becomes a point of rebellion. <laughs> uh, gentleman in the blue shirt, uh, four rows back. Uh, so thank you. I think I'm a medical graduate from India. Uh, by far, the setting and the choice of panelists has been brilliant. In my last eight days, I've been studying here. So thanks, WIPO and CPEP. <laughs> Uh, mine is more of a comment than a question, and that's basically to the question of 2015 to 2018, a million patents. And Adam, I just want to add to the comment of saying that it's, of course, the population explosion. I would say it's not only the population explosion, it's the healthy population explosion with a higher longevity of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, I would like to thank two innovators from America, and that's Jonas Salk mm -hmm. and Albert Sabin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think between them, the OPV, the oral polio vaccine, and the injectable polio vaccine, everyone sitting out in this room mm -hmm. would have had a shot of that. Yep. Right yep. at birth. Yep. I mean, there couldn't be bigger innovators than these two guys. And believe me, with India, I really would like to thank because India has declared polio free in 60 years of these inventions. I, I mean, I, that's the only comment I wanted to add. And Suzy, Patent officers, even in my country, look the same. They're tall, and they have a halo around their head. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, I actually want to turn that into a question. It may not be exactly what he would have been saying, but let me turn it a little, which is to say um, a piece of that longevity, a piece of actually the success story of the last two decades in the developing world is a rising wealth level, a much larger middle class. There are more people alive today who can reasonably become inventors and file a patent in the US internationally than ever before in history. Now, of course, there's no preordained statement that says the US remains the center of this, right? There was a time when all paths flowed through London when it comes to international ideas and flow. So, yeah, what, what's happening around attracting great ideas from developing countries from around the world? Do you see any threats? Uh, what, what keeps this going? Well, the, you know, um, the earth is going through changes. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, it, it's changing the way we live because, well, nature is in control. But 
what that does, it's incumbent upon inventors and scientists to figure how to circumvent those changes or how to survive under the changing conditions. And uh, because the changes become very rapid and most of us have had experiences with it, um, uh, it, it creates a need to come up with a better solution. It comes out, it, it, it encourages inventors and scientists to figure out how we can get through this. Uh, you mentioned longevity. Yes, that's very important. And we've made great changes in, in improving longevity. But we've got a long way to go because there are a lot of people in the world that don't benefit from modern technology. That technology has to be made, let's face it, it has to be made at a price that those, that, that the under, un, under, that the developing countries can, uh, can um, uh, purchase. Uh, so I, I think that that's a big driver also, the necessity, the changes in nature that are causing us to come up with new solutions to problems or the problem, new problems that are created. So that's on, yeah, environmental, climate change, other challenges. Drew, I wonder if you have a comment about just the international role of the USPTO. Sure. Well, um, part, part of our role is to, to work on harmonization, um, to, to put, uh, the, get more similarities between the different offices and the different practices. And one of the challenges that I know inventors face is that uh, different countries have different patent laws, mm -hmm. and it's very hard to you know, get protection in each one, you have to have multiple filings. And so part of our role is to, to uh, is one of working on harmonization issues uh, to see where we can get more similarities and try to foster uh, growth of those similarities. We also have a huge uh, educational um, uh, compartment of the office that um, uh, where we have uh, people in different countries working to educate those countries about patent systems in general and patent laws um, to be able to help them uh, com come up to speed, so to, so to speak. Yeah, we're, we're over time. Is there a web question or are you? Okay, we'll take, is there one last question from the audience right here, <laughs> firsthand? Thank you. This has been a really great talk. Um, I'm gonna go home and try to convince our daughters to <laughs> uh, change their majors. <laughs> anyway, my name is Adrian, and I'm attending uh, the, the summer program with Dr. Uh, with Professor Mossif at the CPIP uh, program. My question is two part. I, I've heard it said somewhere that um, all of invention is problem solving, and if you would let me know if you agree with that, and if you do. Do you, as an inventor, do you just go through life surveying the environment for problems? Um, I have another question also for Ms. Adams and Professor West. Uh, did you ever have a eureka moment that you recall, or did the solutions to your problems occur to you like over a period of time? Is it, so can I take the first part too? Um, which was, uh, uh, I do not believe that invention is, I strongly do not believe that invention is just problem solving. And I do not want to minimize problem solving. It's most, most of what I do in, in, in my career and, and in my work. But um, that implies that you know the exact solution and it's just a matter of steps to get there. And I think that is very different from invention. To me, invention is seeing those opportunities, sort of those out of the box opportunities, uh, and, and solution, solution implies a problem, but seeing those out of the box opportunities where you could come up with something brand, brand new. So I do not agree with the, the statement that um, uh, whoever made it to that uh, invention is simply problem solving. Certainly, problem solving comes into um, you know all the work surrounding invention, but you have to have that creativity and curiosity that doesn't necessarily come with just problem solving. Um, 
The second question was um, Eureka. Eureka. There's plenty. There's plenty of them. There's you know there's there's plenty of times when you you solve a, a problem and you say okay. Phew, got that done. And then there's plenty of times when you come up with a new idea or you solve the problem in a really creative way and you went, oh, usually for me it's when I'm running or <laughs> right before I go to sleep and then I've forgotten it in the morning. Uh, but uh, there are plenty of those eureka moments and I don't know, maybe it has something to do with the way brain, human brains are, are wired. Jim, do you want to? Yeah, um, the, the first question, can, can you phrase it? Because I had a nice inversion there that I forgot. <laughs> it was around uh, invention is problem solving. Yeah, right. It, it, invention solve problems, yes. but not necessarily the ones that the inventor had in mind. Okay, uh, and, and it's really true. I even can cite some examples of that. But um, uh, uh, so, yeah, problem solving is a textbook kind of thing, I guess. You know, you know, it's a book. You got some questions, and you trying to solve a problem. Well, we're trying to solve. We're trying to understand problems that we're, we're trying to understand nature. Well, okay, I'm getting kind of tied up around here, but let, let me see if I can clear it up in the following way. Um, uh, anything or, or nature is a mother of all inventions. What we do is understand how and what nature has done. I'm sorry for the, you know, for the problem in getting that out because it is a very serious question and one that has to be cleared up. Yeah. So you would say that it's more about discovery. Yes. Okay. That's uh, that's uh, the the right word there, and from the standpoint of the Eureka moment, I, I you know I fully agree. I can go to bed with uh, or before going to sleep, come up with the best solution around, only to find out that either I don't remember it the next morning, <laughs> or that it's really a bogus concept. But we have many of those, and that's what makes it fun. Right. We, we do have in our collection some great inventors' notebooks that include things they scribble down in the middle of the night. So I always encourage prospective inventors to, in to fact, keep, keep a notebook by their bed. <laughs> um, look, we're over time. I, this has been an amazing audience. You've been uh, great and obviously in a very amazing panel. Just uh, three things in closing. So first off, please join me in thanking our amazing panel. That was really So, so second, um, I also want to give a, a, a small round of thanks to people who helped make today possible. Um, so Elizabeth Doherty and Larry Terrazano at the USPTO really did masterful work uh, helping organize the event. And then Matt Barbland and uh, Adam Masoff at CPIP, um, and obviously all of you coming from the CPIP program. And then third, my colleagues Will Reynolds, Dan Holm, Eric Hintz, and Allison Oswald did considerable work behind the scenes to make this happen. And before you leave, this is my third point, um, there's several add-on pieces to today's program. So to my left, to your right, we actually have a table of some really remarkable items from our historical collections oriented around historical key patents, key turning points. You'll see some changes in the design of the patent, um, but also a wonderful menu from a 1940 sesquicentennial dinner that featured things like telegraph soup, bird's eye turkey, and a parade of industries. So please check those out. But also uh, to my right, to your left, we have Spark Lab, which is our hands-on invention space. So you get to see kids actually actively engaged in the invention process. And finally, um, on your seats were a handout, a kind of seek and find of some of the most notable patent models around the museum. So we encourage you to go check those out. These are things either the inventor made or held in their hands um, and just kind of a great piece of American history related to invention. So thank you all for coming and thanks again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. It was delight. Yes. We'll see you at the next one. That's great. I just want to get together with That was great.